disease. And so we showed in the recovery trial that patients who required oxygen or invasive mechanical ventilation, we reduced the risk of death by about a fifth in patients on oxygen and about one third in patients in ICU. So that really um, was quite a surprising big effect, actually. We were quite surprised to see that effect. And so that drug is now part of treatment recommendations internationally as part of Thank you. which I recommend, recommend the treatment sure. guidance. The second drug is remdesivir, which has received conditional approval in I think, the US and, and Europe, uh, which is an intravenous treatment, unlike steroids. Um, it's much more expensive and has not shown a, a benefit on mortality, but has shown uh, a benefit in terms of uh, reduced hospital stay. So there was a trial in the United States, well, it was an international trial that led out of the United States that showed a reduction of about four days in duration of hospitalization. But the, the WHO solidarity trial <clears throat> has just reported um, their study of, solid, of, um, of remdesivir, which is about five times as large as the US trial, and they did not show a difference in, in hospitalization. Uh, and overall, if you put together all the trials, there's about five trials of, of remdesivir that have been, been published. If you put that all together, then there may be a marginal uh, benefit on, on the risk of death being reduced, but it's also compatible with, with no, no effect on death. So that's the two drugs that I think have been shown to have an effect. Um, and then there are, there are other treatments uh, being evaluated. I think probably the most promising ones for treatment are what we call the, the antibody-based treatment. So either convalescent plasma, so you're taking the plasma from recovered patients that, that contains a mixture of antibodies um, against um, SARS-CoV-2, giving those to patients and uh, improving their chances of survival. Um, the jury's out on that, but we're studying that. And then there's the monoclonal antibodies, which are the artificial antibodies. Um, which are selected to be very potent against the, the virus. Um, and there is some emerging evidence that they may be beneficial in early treatment. And I think the, the, what makes them attractive is that they have a, a long half-life, as we call it. So they, they last a long time in the body. So you could give one treatment um, either as prophylaxis or, or, or people who have um, early disease but high risk and it may provide protection for several months. So I think they're important that we really study those um, very aggressively because they, they hold a lot of promise, I think. If I'm just on, uh, on that point, when do you expect to, to have enough evidence from the trials to, um, to deploy it uh, at scale? Well, convalescent plasma, um, we're currently running in recovery, the UK-based trial, the largest convalescent plasma trial, we currently have about 1,500 patients versus 1,500 patients not on treatment. Um, we're aiming for 2,000 versus 2,000. So we could have a result on convalescent plasma in the next um, you know, six to eight weeks. Um, and th that would be very important. That's a resource that's out there. Obviously it needs scale up of, of collection of convalescent plasma, but if it worked, it is a scalable um, treatment and it's, it's attractive because it would also be available internationally because countries could, could create their own pool of treatment. With the, the monoclonal antibodies, they've come much later into the trial because they took a while to be developed as investigational drugs and to go through the, the phase one safety data. So we've introduced those in the UK, but we currently only have about, I think it's a 150 patients versus 150 patients. So we're in the early stages of that. Thank you very much. I'll turn to Jeremy Hunt and then Graham Stringer. Good morning, Professor Horby. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I've got a slightly technical question, if I may, about the regulatory approval process for uh, these new treatments, which could be very relevant to both monoclonal antibodies and convalescent plasmas. Um, normally, the process involves um, approval on the basis of both safety and efficacy. And I just wanted to ask you whether in the middle of a pandemic, there would be benefit in allowing companies to put their products on the mass market as soon as safety had been approved, but when you were still trying to establish e efficacy, just on the basis that there are people dying of this disease every day, and therefore it may save lives to speed the process up. 
I think that is the wrong approach. Uh, you know, I feel that very strongly, actually. We've seen, you know, I've been involved in a lot of epidemics and we often see the argument given that <clears throat> these things might work um, and we're in the middle of a crisis, so we should roll them out um, on the basis that they're probably okay and they may save lives. What we've actually seen is that that delays um, actually understanding how the drugs work and if they are safe and effective. What happens is <clears throat> you get widespread use of the drugs and it actually um, impairs the ability to run trials because the patients say, no, well, I can get it outside the trial, so I'll have it outside the trial. You then have numerous biases in who gets the treatment and who doesn't get the treatment, which it's impossible to unpick later. And you end up several months down the line um, with uh, you know, tens of thousands of patients using the drugs and no idea if it works. And there's fantastic examples of that. We saw that in the 2009 pandemic. We saw 40,000 people treated off-label, <coughs> by which I mean <coughs> the drugs that weren't registered and proven for treatment, uh, but they were given to patients hospitalised with flu. We came out of that pandemic with no new evidence and no new drugs. In the US, they've given convalescent plasma to tens of thousands of patients outside of the trial. We still don't know if it works. If they put those patients into a trial, we'd have a definitive answer by now. So I think you really have to make sure that this is done in the trial. It's the only way. Thank you. Um, and I just had a question about long COVID and whether there are any drugs being developed or any research happening, because I think we've got King's College studies say there are 30,000 people who've uh, got really pretty horrific symptoms even after three months. Um, and I just wondered what the situation was with respect to drugs that might help those people. <coughs> Yeah, long COVID is a really, really important issue. <clears throat> it's clear that you know, COVID is a multi-system disease, both acutely and chronically. Uh, it's clear that quite a substantial proportion of patients who've had the disease require long-term care and follow-up. We don't really understand the nature of it. Um, there have been some reviews that suggest that it's probably a, you know, a, a cluster of, syn of syndromes rather than one single syndrome. And so it does need research to understand who's at risk for the chronic symptoms, what are the different clusters and, and the organ systems involved, and how you can both mitigate that, because there may be uh, treatments that you can give during the acute illness that reduce the risk of getting the chronic symptoms, which would be the best thing to do. Um, but for those people who do get chronic symptoms, managing those both through rehabilitation and treatments. At the moment, we, we don't know. Uh, research is really important. I know that there is a, a number of initiatives internationally and in the UK, there is the, um, the post-hospitalisation COVID study, FOSP um, COVID, um, run by um, Chris Brightling, which is planning to enrol 10,000 patients and follow them up um, and intensively investigate some of those to see um, what's causing the chronic symptoms. And is it your view that that research is being adequately funded at the moment? I believe so. Um, I think the, the, that large cohort of 10,000 patients, which is linked to some of the trials, so we're linking the data from the recovery trial to that that, that cohort, so we can see if the treatments given in, in our study affect the risk of long-term um, follow-up, uh, of long-term complications. So um, I think that that cohort is extremely important, um, but I think also patient engagement is really important and, and, and really um, getting the patient groups involved. We lost the end of um, what you just said there, Pro Professor Holby. Yeah, I, I think that the, um, the long-term follow-up and engagement with patient groups is, is, is happening uh, and, and I believe is adequate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham Stringer and then uh, Chris Clarkson. Professor, from the first reports of this disease coming out of China to the first death attributed to it in, on March the 5th, I think it was, in this country, did we prepare quickly enough and appropriately enough to deal with this disease? What, using the benefit of hindsight, what could and should we have done? I think that's a, it's a, you know, a very broad question. If I stick to um, therapeutics, uh, I think that 
we've been poor at, well, not just the UK, but, but globally, we've been poor at investing in the development of platforms for developing new, new treatments, uh, and as you probably hear later, new, new vaccines for emerging infections. There is quite a lot of work done at the very basic level, but you really need to bring that right through so you have uh, treatments that are ready to give to patients um, at the start of an epidemic. Um, you know, a good example is the monoclonal antibodies, which um, the platforms are there, um, but it's not until September that we had them ready to give to patients. Now, you can't do it the monoclonal antibodies before you have the, the new infection arise, but you could accelerate that so that it could have been ready perhaps by August as opposed to by September. And we could have had UK-based products as opposed to, to, to the product we're using, which is from a US company. So I think you could do much more to develop classes of drugs uh, right through, do the, do the safety data, do the pharmacology, so you know what doses to use and you know the safety profile, so that you're ready to go straight into patients um, when an epidemic hits us. Would it have helped to have recognised loss of taste and smell as symptomatic of this disease <coughs> earlier? Would that, would that have made any difference to the progress of the disease? I don't think so. That has um, arisen as a, an unexpected symptom um, in early on <coughs> from China. It was clearly predominantly a respiratory um, disease with fever, cough, shortness of breath. Uh, it took some while for that symptom of uh, loss of taste and smell to become apparent. Um, it does add something to the um, the sensitivity and specificity of the case definition, but it's not always a very early symptom. So it, it's not, um, it, it adds something, but, but not a huge amount to detecting early cases. Um, I think what's actually more important is the, the, the ability to you know, diagnose cases with laboratory tests um, quickly and at scale. And as we've seen, um, obviously the development of the, the test and trace system um, has been, um, you know, a, a huge effort, um, and obviously still needs work. But I think that's one of the most critical components. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Clarkson, um, and then James Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, Professor, I just want to drill down a bit now on uh, new medicines and treatments. So the UK seems to have been leading the way in getting randomised controlled trials up and running. But I just want to understand what the main challenges have been. I think we've been very successful you know it, it, it's um it's probably true to say that the uk has of any country has has been the most successful in running clinical trials um for treatment of, of covid19 um we, we've been successful because of um the nhs and because of the nihr the national Institute of health research that's really been absolutely critical that we had that infrastructure in place across the whole nhs so we could open the study across um, hospitals across the UK and we could recruit really at pace. So at the moment we're recruiting about 150 patients per day into the recovery trial, which is you know, more than many trials are recruiting in total. Um, and so we're by far the biggest trial in the world. Um, so it's, it's mostly a story of success. But at the same time, the system is very stretched and we're only recruiting about 10% of all patients admitted to hospitals. And it's important to understand that we're talking about, say, getting an answer on convalescent plasma in you know, six to eight weeks. If we doubled re recruitment, we'd get an answer in half the time. And that's true for the monoclonal antibodies and all the drugs that we're studying. And so we have 10% of patients enrolled. That means 90% are not enrolled. Uh, and we need to understand why we can't increase that number. And if we look at across the, the hospitals in, in the NHS, some of them are doing very well. Some of them are recruiting 30, uh, you know, 35% of all patients into the trial. And that's fantastic. There'll be patients who are not eligible, patients who decline to be involved. So I think we should be aiming at that kind of number. At the other end of the scale, we've got hospitals who have recruited many hundreds of patients in the second wave and have re recruited um, less than 1% of patients. And there, there's what, you know, there, there are hospitals that have recruited two, 300 patients and have recruited none into the recovery trial. Um, and so there is scope for improvement and we need to understand 
how we do that. And I think it comes down you know, a lot to um, resourcing uh, of the um, of the, the research staff, um, empowering of the non-research staff to get involved in research, and to some extent perhaps some performance management of some of the trusts where really I can't see a reason that you would not be able to recruit z any patients out of 300 that have been recruited in the second wave. And that this is a national effort to find treatments, and if we want to find treatments um, like dexamethasone before Christmas, then if we can get 10% recruitment up to 30%, then we, we will find answers much quicker. So um, <clears throat> I think it sounds like it's, it's fair to say that it's been a learning experience. How much has your current approach been informed by previous outbreaks? And what would you say are the known unknowns that you still need to sort of solidify in order to improve your approach? So yeah, we've learned a lot from previous outbreaks. I've been involved in trials and outbreaks uh, for some time. And we learned that the most important um, parameter really is speed. You, you have to get the trials up and running <clears throat> extremely quickly because you get a very quick increase in cases and you have to capture the cases and enroll them. And you have to do it at scale because the outbreak uh, moves around geographically. So you can't just have all your hospitals in the trial in one place. You have to have them scattered across the country so you can capture the epidemiology that moves around the country. And you have to keep it simple because uh, the hospital staff are under extreme pressure and you need a trial that can be embedded into care, can be part of routine care. When you're talking to patients about um, they're going to need stockings and heparin to stop them getting blood clots and they're going to get oxygen, you should also ask them and, and their experimental drugs and we'd like to be in a trial to contribute to this. It needs to be into routine care. So I, I think we we have learnt those lessons and, and we've put them into practice in, in this outbreak, which is why we've been so successful in the UK. I think we've been a bit less successful out of hospital. The trial that I co-lead is, is in hospitalised patients, but there's also the prophylaxis trials, which I talked about, which is you know, giving preventative treatments. And I do think there's real scope for that. You know, a good example is, is care homes, where people are very vulnerable, very high um, death rates. Um, and for example, the monoclonal antibodies would be a great um, drug to try and prophylaxis there. You give one, you know, one injection, it may provide cover for several months. Um, that's a group that may or may not respond well to vaccines because of you know, an aging immune system. Um, and we haven't yet got those trials off the ground. And the outpatient trials also, um, you know, sort of primary care trials have been slower to get going. So I think in the hospital system, we've, we've cracked it. Um, apart from increasing the recruitment numbers. Uh, I think in, in, in primary care and prophylaxis trials, there's still work to be done. Thank you. Um, just one more, if you'll permit me. Um, obviously, from a research perspective, we're, we're doing COVID all the time at the moment. So I just want to understand what the impact's been on research in other areas and what are the wider implications in, in the sort of longer term? Yeah, you're right. In the, in the second way, um, we've seen um, an attempt to return to more normal practice in the NIHR research network that we're utilizing for the COVID trials. Also have a whole bunch of other trials to be doing, um, you know, in cancer and cardiovascular disease and renal disease. And, and those cannot be neglected. So we do have to find a solution. We lost your sound again yes, um, briefly, Professor Hawking. Um, we lost sorry. your sound uh, briefly again just at the end of your. Yeah, answer. so we do need. To, so we do need to find a, a sustainable solution to running the COVID trials alongside the the other research that needs to be done. We've now got the vaccine trials, so there is increasing pressure, and whilst. That there is uh, groups and people like myself saying we need to increase recruitment to the COVID trials in hospitals. The, the NHS staff are also being um, asked to increase recruitment to vaccine trials to go back to the, the routine research in, in cancer, etc. And so they are under pressure. So we need to, I think, talk with the teams on the ground to find out what can be done to deliver all of these, uh, these much needed research. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Just, just on the recruitment um, to the trials, uh, the, the recovery trial programme is, um, is one of the best, if not the best, in the, the world. Uh, we have the NHS, which is uh, a unique uh, asset. The, the level of recruitment that you describe is, is disappointingly low. Uh, if we, and as you've um, recognised, we should increase that. What can we do? Who's, who's in charge of it? Who can drive um, better recruitment, which would be good for, I assume, individual patients uh, and patients uh, as a collective? I think there's, there's two, two key groups, really. It's, it's the NHS executive um, and it's the NIHR. Um, I think we have to be very careful not to um, you know, browbeat people on the ground. We're, we're relying on you know, research nurses, nurses, clinicians who are under extreme pressure, um, both routine care, um, routine research, and then the COVID research. Um, and I think we need to talk to them and then work with the NIHR infrastructure and the NHS executive to work out how we can support them to um, recruit patients. Um, probably also um, we could do with some more, I would say, you know, marketing of the trials. You know, it's really important that the patients um, and their relatives are aware of the availability of the trials and the importance of them. Um, you know, when a patient asks them, you know, why should I be in this trial? You know, the answer can be, well, you know, you're receiving dexamethasone. The reason you're getting that is because patients before you were in a trial, so you can make a contribution to future patients by being in the trial. And we have been having discussions with NIHR and the NHS uh, executive about um, how we can identify ways to support better recruitment. Well, one of we obviously for the reasons you say, you don't want to put extra pressure um, on the people that are caring for patients, and therefore the approach may be to simplify and to to standardise. So it's a matter of routine rather than you know, individual persuasion, uh, as it were. Do, do you think there's the scope for uh, for that sort of approach of making it a routine consent? Yeah, I think what we've tried to do is to make certainly the recovery trial, part of routine care. We've said that this doesn't have to be done by you know, research teams, which are, you know, are, are limited in their numbers and are limited in their working at us. This is something that should be and can be done by the, the care staff on the wards, the nurses and the doctors on the wards. And so we've specifically designed it um, so that it can be done like that. And I think it's important to work so that it can be embedded in, as part of the care package. And I think there's a lesson there for uh, research in the NHS going forward. Um, if we can do a trial of you know, 15,000 patients in COVID over a few months, um, perhaps that can be done in other diseases in the future. Um, and we can uh, make our, our, our clinical evidence base much stronger by you know, making research part of routine care as opposed to a sort of specialist um, activity for those down the corridor in the research room. Thank you. And that, that would apply, uh, would it, to primary care and um, care homes, as you've uh, suggested? I think in primary care, yes. I think care homes is, is, is a different uh, kettle of fish, really. Um, and uh, because the, you know, this, this, the, the training of, of the staff there, etc., and the turnover of staff, etc., makes it a bit more challenging. Thank you. Uh, James Davis um, and then Luke Evans. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Professor Horby, for your time this morning. There's understandably huge public interest in drug treatment for COVID, <clears throat> and I am sure many of my colleagues also are frequently contacted by constituents who say, what about vitamin D, what about ivermectin, uh, that was raised with me this week. Can you outline, um, in terms of the recovery trial, how you identify candidates, drug candidates, uh, to go forward for evaluation? Yes, it's gone through some evolution. Um, originally, um, there is a, you know, a government committee, a, a, a DHST committee called NERVTAC, the New and Emerging Respiratory Viruses Threats Advisory Group, that, that looked at um, the very first tranche of, of drugs that were available um, and made a recommendation about which of those went into recovery trial. <coughs> then we went through a phase where um, I think like many of, many of us, we were bombarded uh, um, with emails and letters from people uh, recommending 
a whole range of treatments, you know, hundreds of them, um, which really we couldn't keep up with. We couldn't look at all of those in, in a really rigorous way um, and screen them and decide what comes in next into the trials. So what's been really useful is the third phase, which has been the setup of the, um, the COVID Therapeutics Advisory Panel, which is a, a panel that's been set up by um, the Department of Health um, to look at all of the, the options that have been put forward. And they've got a number of subgroups. I mean, there's, there's three broad categories of drugs. There's the antiviral drugs, there's the immunomodulator sort of anti-inflammatory drugs, and then there's the, the anti-clotting drugs. And so they've set up subcommittees who, who are looking at all those. And, and they've really done a fantastic job. They've been very rigorous. You know, they're, they're producing you know, multi-page reports on every drug and very systematically looking at what's the evidence base for them. Um, and then either recommending that they're, they're not prioritised, that they are um, sort of shelved for now, pending new data coming out, um, or that they are recommended for going to trials. And that's been really very useful for us. And actually, this week in recovery, we've just added aspirin um, to the trial because clotting seems to be a big problem. And aspirin is a very widely available and cheap drug which, um, you know, if, it, if it were to work, would be a, a huge boost. Um, and that came out of the, the CTAP, that, that advisory panel's process of looking at all the options and saying, well, this is the one we think should go forward. And so I think that that's, that is functioning very well and we're very happy with that. Thank you. And are there any emerging developments internationally that recovery isn't looking at that you think we should keep our eye on? We're, we're watching carefully. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of trials out there, many thousands of trials, so it's a bit difficult to keep track, but most of them are small and are unlikely to give definitive answers, so we're keeping our eyes on the, on the, the bigger trials. Um, in terms of antivirals, I'm, I'm afraid that the, um, the field is, is rather disappointing. Um, as we saw, remdesivir, which was one of the front leaders, has you know, probably an effect on duration of hospital stay, but perhaps not on mortality. The monoclonals are exciting. Um, there is emerging data of efficacy in outpatients, so preventing um, hospitalization and reducing duration of stay, so that they are promising. But two of the big um, companies, um, Eli Lilly and Regeneron, have, have temporarily suspended their, their trials in hospitalized patients. Uh, well, Eli Lilly stopped theirs for lack of effectiveness and Regeneron have paused theirs um, for potential safety concerns. So that's a little bit disappointing, but we need to see more data to know if that is something to worry about. There's not many patients in those trials, so I think it, it, it remains to be seen whether they'll be effective in hospitalised patients. Um, the convalescent plasma we're keeping an eye on, again, I think the answer will come from recovery. Um, um, otherwise, I don't think there's anything we're missing, but as I said, we've just add, added um, mm. aspirin, mm -hmm. um, anti-clotting drugs, I think, is the area where we did have a gap and we've just um, hopefully filled that. Understood. And finally, from me, how effective do you think the NHS has been at adopting best practice management of COVID patients? Good question. Um, what we've actually seen is that, um, although it's early, early days, it would appear that the case fatality rate in hospital virus patients has come down quite a lot. Um, at, at the moment, um, it's looking like the case fatality rate is about 15% in hospitalised patients, having come down from about 30% in wave one, so it's really a big difference. Wave two, so I think we have to be a bit cautious, that may creep up a bit. Um, Professor Hoy, we'd lost you for a brief it. second there when I think you were giving us a crucial figure. So would you just um, <laughs> uh, go back to that? So the, the case fatality rate in hospitalised patients appeared to be about 30% in wave one. It now appears to be about 15%, so about half, which is really fantastic news. We have to be a bit cautious because the age profile is not the same at the moment and as more older people come in, that will creep up, I think. But it does indicate, I think, that the NHS is getting better at treating uh, COVID patients. And I think there's a number of areas where that improvement has happened. One is in the use of respiratory support, the use of oxygen, uh, non-invasive ventilation, so the face masks with positive pressure and the hoods, um, 
and um, intubation in basic mechanical ventilation. I think um, this, the, the clinicians are getting better at, 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 at um, managing that part of the disease and that is improving um, survival. I think we're seeing better use of anticoagulants, heparin and other anticoagulants to prevent clotting and one would anticipate that the introduction of dexamethasone has also had an impact because as I said earlier that, that would um, be something that would reduce, reduce case fatality rates. What I would like to see is, is, is data on the proportion of patients who ought to get dexamethasone who are getting it um, and we are trying to capture that through various systems but we don't yet have a Thank you. Um, just before I go to uh, Luke Evans, um, Barbara Keeley had a, a supplementary question uh, on your answer on trials in uh, social care settings. Barbara. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to go back and ask, ask you exactly what needs to be done to get these trials of monoclonal antibodies off the ground in care homes. I mean, clearly, the care sector is not, you know, we understand, like the NHS, more difficult to get the trials off the ground. But you mentioned the need to market uh, the different types of trials. Is anything happening? Is there work going on with the care sector? There, there is. So prophylaxis, I think, has been identified as an area that was, was a, um, uh, lacking. And so there's been efforts to change that. And a call has been put out as in a, uh, a call for research groups to do some uh, to run a trial in care homes. So it's, it's been recognised as a problem. Um, I, think, I believe funding has been identified and uh, a call has been put out to research groups to put themselves forward to run such trials in care homes. We also then need to secure supplies of the drug. Mm -hmm. So discussions will need to be had with the companies to make sure that we can secure supplies of the drug for those trials. And I think once we have, you know, um, the right research group and we have access to the drugs then we can you know, market that um, and I think care homes ought to find this a very interesting proposition um, because you know, a, a one-off um, you know, injection that may provide protection for several months over the winter to care home residents would, would be attractive and that's why I think it's a really important trial to do. And, and what, just finally then, what, what sort of time scale do you see? I mean, you, you say that it's at the stage that a call's gone out. When, 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 could, when could something happen? I honestly don't know the answer to that, but I think it really needs to be ex really, you know, put the, uh, the, the accelerator on this because, you know, as, as you know, we're, we're, we're still um, in the midst of the second wave um, and we're coming into the winter season. We've seen that infections in younger age groups does bleed through into older age groups and um, and into care homes. And I think, although measures are being put in place to try and protect care homes, inevitably there will be some leakage and there will be care home outbreaks. And we need to be able to test the efficacy of those drugs during those outbreaks. So I would say there, sh there should be uh, a great deal of urgency to get these trials up and running in the next um, next few weeks, if possible. Yeah, and, and is and is there? You say they should be, but is there? I, I I can't answer that question. I don't know. I know I know that it is perceived as being an important uh, important issue, um, but I think that the, the, the um, who's responsible for driving that, uh, Professor Holby? If we wanted to take it up, who should we take it up with? probably with the DHSC because they've commissioned a group to look at prophylaxis and, and I, I believe it's the NIHR put out a call. I, I would anticipate that they're treating this with great urgency and um, if you wanted to check that then that, it would be um, probably best through the DHSC. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. Thank you. Uh, Luke Evans. Uh, thank you very much Professor and in the spirit of uh, uh, lessons learned I'm just keen to quickly counter over the pathophysiology uh, we've heard in the health select committee um, a, an airborne virus in droplets comes in through the mucosa hits the ACE2 receptors uh, people become unwell and then after seven days for some reason there's a cytokine storm and people end up in uh, ARDS acute respiratory uh, distress is that still the way it's it's understood at the moment Yes, pretty much. I mean, you just get a very professional. <laughs> oh, I'm a GP by background, so I should declare that. Okay, uh, okay. So. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, pretty much. I think there are still some questions. There is this um, dichotomy that's been um, proposed of, you know, a, a viral replication stage early on, 
that then transitions into an inflammatory stage. I don't know whether cytokine storm is quite the right word, I think that, you know, but, but there's certainly an inflammatory stage. But, but I think there's still a question about to what extent there is still viral replication ongoing in that inflammatory phase. There may be a tendency to say, okay, antivirals will only work early and anti-inflammatories will work late. My, my feeling is actually that even in the severer patients, you see data that um, viral loads are higher and more prolonged in patients with more severe disease. And so the inflammation may well be being driven by continued viral replication particularly in the lower respiratory tract, because a lot of the data we have is just from swabs in the upper respiratory tract. And so that in hospitalized patients, we shouldn't neglect the virus. We should be looking at um, immunomodulators, antithrombotics, but also antivirals. Well, that's really important because at the, at the point there, the, we had the committee heard that we weren't able to identify who was likely to go into ARDS. That was the hardest part of seeing who's going to recover well and who's going to be the 10% that need hospital. Is there any understanding from your work in the research or therapeutics that can target that to identify those people and target prevent those people ever getting to hospital in the first place? I think there's potentially three ways of doing that. One is you know, sort of the broad risk, risk groups. Um, you know, and age is clearly, clearly the, the biggest one. Um, but there are people with you know, comorbidities who, who are not so old who also end up in hospital. And there's also people who don't have comorbidities and end up in hospital. So I think you have to go beyond the sort of the crude risk factors of, of age and comorbidities um, and look at um, biomarkers is, is one way to do it. So look at if you can detect signals in, in the blood either through um, you know, chemicals um, or um, the, the way that the, the DNA is being um, um, transcripted, so they call it transcriptome analysis, so you can get early signals of those who are progressing towards severe disease and not to, to, to progress to severe disease. I don't think we have those yet, but there are studies I'm going looking at those. I was going to say, we're not in the position yet to have that on a, on a nationwide basis. And you picked up on the risk factors, and we know now from the studies that obesity, as well as age number one, obesity, diabetes are, are really important. Is there any therapeutics being targeted specifically at those risk factors? Or again, are we too far out and don't have enough data yet? I think we're too far out. And I think things like you know obesity, diabetes are are markers of, of processes and what we need to understand is, 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 what, is what is the underlying process of why somebody with obesity or diabetes becomes severely ill and I think that's where the, um, the biological studies looking at the biomarkers but also looking at the host genome. Um, there's been some nice studies, that, the, the National Genomic Study that's identified particular genes associated with um, viral um, uh, innate immune responses um, that would suggest that there may be certain people who have, you know, um, less well-functioning parts of their immune system who you could identify through genomic studies who may be at risk of severe disease and you could target. So I think in the future we may, may be able to identify people through either, either biomarkers or genomics, but we're not there yet. Final question around these risk factors is we know from the, the data that's coming out that BMA, uh, particularly the frontline professionals were targeted more so. Um, this uh, systematic review done in the Lancet that pulled all these studies together said, look, it's still unconclusive, but it seems to broadly be biological related around ACE2 receptors, risk factors that are there, and then health inequalities uh, behind it. Is there any uh, thought in your uh, side about the therapeutics, about targeting specifically, for example, blood pressure, obviously we have a different set for Afro-Caribbean, we use a different blood pressure medication based on that. Is that being looked at, at targeting therapeutics for ethnicity, depending on efficacy? Or again, are we too far away from, from having the data to, to support that? No, it's a very interesting um, proposition, and I think, as you as you highlighted well, that the, the, the BAME um, risk group um, is 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 multifactorial, uh, you know, socioeconomic um, exposure through um, work settings um, and potential biological um, um, risk factors as well. And I think the more we can look into the biological risk factors, then we can look at, um, as, as we say, personalised medicine, where we where we target. Um, certain uh, risk groups. As you've said, the, the renin angiotensin system, you know, the, the ACE inhibitor, uh, sorry, the ACE receptor, etc., is another therapeutic 
that area that, that the CTAC committee is looking at. At the moment, we haven't. I think we need more biological evidence of, of that targeting that part of the system would have an effect on um, um, the development of disease, and I think we need to do more studies. And is work being looked at in both those areas? Then is the final question. Well, CTAP is looking at the, the emerging evidence that's coming out around the angiotensin system. Um, I'm not aware particularly of, of work ongoing, but I think what you would want to see is animal models of, of that system um, and how, if you intervene in that system in the animal models, whether it has an effect on virus replication and disease. Um, but I, I, I don't know what's going on in the area. And Thank the you. final question to, to round all up is, um, you mentioned therapeutics. When people have um, long COVID or have had it, is there any form of long-term therapeutic, a bit like we have uh, blood pressure or statins to use? Do you see that there being a medication as a, uh, as a sort of secondary um, prevention in the future, like we would use aspirin or clopidogrel uh, in those natures to try and prevent anyone ever you know, being reinfected, supposedly if we don't have an immunity and vaccine? Um, so do you mean secondary prevention for long COVID or for... Yeah, or, or, or a COVID reinfection um, if, if immunity isn't, is proven that you could get reinfected and we don't have a vaccine and we have to live with it. Is, is there going to, do you foresee a, a therapeutic position where someone will be taking that to, to prevent uh, once they've had an infection? Just briefly, if uh, you would, Professor Horby. Yeah, so it is a possibility. Um, we saw for influenza that, that, that the neuraminidase inhibitors are actually much more effective in prophylaxis than they are in treatment of severe disease. Um, so it's conceivable you could get a drug that could be uh, a successful prophylactic. Um, but I think we're a long way off that, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Luke. And, and finally, from me, Professor Horby, uh, the Science and Technology Committee took evidence from uh, practitioners in some East Asian countries um, who told us that their practice was to bring in people with relatively mild symptoms into hospital settings um, so that they could uh, help them and, and prevent them becoming severe. The practice here in the NHS has been for people to wait until they've been really quite sick uh, before they uh, went into hospital. Um, have, have you learnt anything from the experience um, through the pandemic of other countries and as we go into this, uh, this new wave, will we be changing that practice? In general, I think it's a fair principle to say that you know, early treatment is better um, if you have an effective intervention. Um, you know, the one we have um, of dexamethasone clearly is for the inflammatory stage, so it's for late disease. So we're still, I think, searching for a, an intervention in early disease. Remdesivir um, is an antiviral, but it's, 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 it's not easy to use. It's an intravenous infusion and it's quite expensive. And so we still need a, um, an easy to use and relatively affordable uh, early intervention. Um, and if you had that, then that would certainly be an area where you'd want to target that. I think that could be done um, on an outpatient basis through primary care. But first things first, we need to find a, a medicine that, that is effective at that stage of disease. Uh, what about the provision of uh, oxygen? Um, Alison Pittard uh, of the Faculty of Intensive Medicine um, has said that the, the experience is that uh, oxygen therapy short of intubation uh, has shown itself to be perhaps more effective than was first thought at the, the beginning of the, the pandemic, which requires people to be, uh, to be there earlier than if they need to, to go into an ICU. I believe we're still learning a lot about what's, what's the appropriate interventions. I think things have improved in the, in, in the use of oxygen and, and ventilation, but there are still knowledge gaps and there are some trials ongoing. There's one called um, Recovery Respiratory Support that's looking at, 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 at um, different oxygen interventions and which one is, is optimal. So uh, I think we're improving. Uh, studies are ongoing and hopefully that, will com that improvement will continue. Thank you. Uh, well, Professor Hall, we're very grateful for your evidence uh, this morning and for your uh, very important work um, uh, on behalf of us all in advancing uh, these uh, therapies.
thank you very much indeed. We'll now turn to our uh, second panel of witnesses. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome two people who are leading uh, two of the potential vaccines being developed against uh, COVID. Uh, and they are Professor Andrew Pollard, who is the Professor of Paediatric Infection uh, and Immunity at the University of Oxford. Uh, and Professor Pollard is the Chief Trial Investigator of the Oxford uh, Vaccine Trial. Uh, and Professor Robin Shattuck, who is the Chair uh, in Mucosal Infection and Immunity at Imperial College London. And he is the Principal Investigator for Imperial's uh, COVID-19 uh, prospective uh, vaccine. Uh, perhaps I could start uh, with a question to uh, Professor Pollard. Uh, when do you think your vaccine will be available for deployment? Um, uh, thanks for that question. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, the, uh, the, the first uh, step is to reach the point uh, where uh, we can uh, do an analysis and find out whether or not the vaccine works. And that, that's what uh, our job is to do, is to conduct rigorous clinical trials um, to, to reach a point where we can um, actually do that analysis. And I'm uh, optimistic that we could reach that point before the end of this year to do an analysis. Um, your question, though, is about deployment, and there's, uh, there's two steps that um, have to happen after that. First of all, um, all of the data um, needs to be put together and presented to the regulators, both here and in other countries around the world. The regulators then have to review all of that, and we absolutely need that to happen uh, so that there's very careful scrutiny of everything that's been done in the clinical trials to look at their integrity and the quality of the data um, and uh, to verify um, that the results are correct. Um, and then uh, the policy decision um, about who should get it um, and uh, the provision and deployment that would happen after that. Um, so I think, I think the answer is that, that our bit um, we're getting closer to, but we're not there yet. Um, and then there's these other steps which you'll have to follow on. There was um, a degree of optimism expressed by the, um, the Chief Scientific Advisor and the Chief Medical Officer um, uh, in terms of vaccines uh, coming to, uh, to our aid. Um, do you expect them to be uh, available and to be started to be deployed um, in terms of your central expectation? I understand that it's subject to, uh, to different obstacles, but is it your central expectation that we'll be able to start distributing them before Christmas? I think it's very difficult to answer the question because, first of all, we, we have to do the analyses to find out whether they work. Um, and if they do, um, then uh, there's these other steps that have to be gone through. And the timelines for those are, are not entirely clear to me at, at the moment. Um, I think there is um, a small chance of that being possible, but I, I, I just don't know. And of course, uh, our trials are only one of many that are going on around the world, a number of which may well report before the end of the year. And uh, so those um, steps will need to be happening for multiple different products. And I, you know, I certainly hope that we have lots of successes uh, with the different platform technologies that are being used, because not just for the UK, but for the world, to have um, supply of vaccines for 7 billion people potentially um, really needs lots of success for, for all the different developers. Well, we all share that uh, view. Uh, what, what do you believe um, should be the, the level of efficiency uh, of a vaccine, yours and others, uh, to justify its approval and deployment in the middle of a pandemic uh, such as we have? Well, I, I think that's a, a, a question for those who will be involved in the policy decision, probably. Um, but uh, but I, you know, perhaps just um, walking through how you get to, to that point might be helpful. Um, the, uh, the FDA have set, uh, so that's the, the, the regulator in the US, has, has set the bar um, and it has to, uh, the vaccines have to be at least 50% effective. And that, that doesn't mean that, that in the US they want the vaccines to be only 50%, but they, they, um, they recognize that if you could reach 50%, that has a huge impact in the pandemic. If we halve the number of deaths or hospitalizations here in the UK for the NHS, that, that is a dramatic change from where we are today. So they've set the bar at that level, but to be able to scientifically test 50%, is a lot harder. You need a lot more cases to occur in the trials to rigorously be able to show that you've got at least 50%. And so to reach that, uh, that threshold, if it is only 50% effective, will take longer. Um, so I think uh, we're all hoping that vaccines will be more effective than that, which means that we'll have an answer sooner. And, uh, but what, what the actual level of um, uh, efficacy is, 
um, is unknown at the moment. No one has unblinded their trials and, and looked at the data um, so far. Um, you know, I, I think when you sort of take that argument further, if, if vaccines only present, prevented 40% of the cases, um, would that be useful for the NHS? These are the sorts of decisions that potentially policymakers may need to be thinking through um, in uh, the months uh, ahead, uh, depending on where vaccines land. As I said, let, I mean, I think we all hope that, that if indeed the rigorous trials show that they do work, that we have much higher efficacy than that. But we do need to be thinking about how would we handle vaccines which were less effective. Indeed, and, and it's I think the days and weeks ahead, uh, perhaps more than the uh, the months ahead, and it's useful to know what the FDA uh, has said on that. The, the, there are, uh, are there not uh, vaccines against other diseases, against uh, influenza, for example, that do have, um, that are licensed at a, a lower rate of uh, efficiency? Yes, I, I mean, influenza is a difficult one because in a good year, you can actually get quite high efficacy of the influenza vaccines. But there are lots of reasons why for some years, because the vaccine doesn't match terribly well to the virus that actually arrives um, in that season where the protection is a lot lower. Um, so I, I think influenza is slightly difficult just because of that variability. Most of the vaccines we use routinely um, in the NHS have much higher efficacy, certainly over 70% and often over 80% or 90%. I see. Thank you. Perhaps I can just briefly uh, put the same uh, question in terms of the uh, the timeline uh, to Professor Shattuck um, before I turn to my colleagues. Yes, our timelines are slightly longer than with uh, the Oxford vaccine because we're developing a completely new technology that's never been in clinical trials before. And so that's taken us longer to uh, get to the stage of being able to move into efficacy trials. But with the right level of, of support, um, we could deliver an efficacy signal at midway through next year um, with regulatory approval following closely after that. And I think it's important to recognise that right now we don't know which of any of these vaccines will work and what success will look like, whether that's success at preventing disease or success at preventing transmission. And those different outcomes will have very different impacts on how those vaccines are used. And the, one of the advantages of the technology that we're developing is that it can be used for repeated boosting immunizations, either to boost existing vaccines or to boost itself. So if immunity wanes, we would be well positioned with this te technology to provide boosting strategies for the UK. Thank you very much, dear. I'll turn to Jeremy Hunt. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Um, I've just got one question, but I'd be very grateful to both of you um, for answering it, which is, uh, I'd like to understand what the likelihood is of developing uh, of, of your vaccine being something that you would give to the whole population or whether there are chunks of the population that you would not uh, be likely to want to give it to for example children um, some people say that with a vaccine that's developed in a in in a hurry as this rightly is being done these both are being done um, you don't know about long-term neurological effects so if you have a group like children you might say uh, if they're not going to suffer badly if they get COVID they shouldn't get the vaccine and I just wonder what your view is as the likelihood of giving this to everyone. Let's start with uh, Professor Pollard. Um, well I, I think um, the, the first thing to, to say is just to, to deal with your point about so the in a hurry. I mean clearly um, there's been due urgency to try to um, accelerate all of the development that's going on and the clinical trials. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that things have been done in any way in less stringently than normal. We're, we're following the same uh, regulatory processes and the same stringency, the same quality control of the vaccines um, that you would expect in, in normal times. What has been incredibly successful, I think, um, through the development work here and in other countries, um, has been that many of the normal obstacles to speed have not been there. Now, for example, funding. Um, it, it, we had a bit of a, a, a problem at the beginning working out the funding strategies, but since um, really we got started, it's been very clear from the government that funding should but not be an obstacle to moving ahead. And of course, with normal vaccine development, you do your first trial, and then you may wait another year for um, funding to become available so you can do the next trial. Here, that hasn't been um, a hold up at all. So I, I think from a, 
uh, the process side, the regulatory process, uh, and so on. We've not had um, any of those um, delays. Um, the other thing, from a um, sort of a, a, a sort of in a hurry perspective, is for most um, drugs or vaccines, we have relatively small numbers of people um, who are normally recruited into um, clinical trials before licensure. So, for vaccines in Europe, somewhere between three and five thousand uh, would be studied in clinical trials as a standard um, before licensure. And here we, we're talking just within our trials um, of the Oxford vaccine, there's already 23,000 people enrolled. Um, with the partnership with AstraZeneca, that will rise to 50,000 over the next uh, month or two. So these are um, much larger trials that have a lot more information um, about the safety of these vaccines um, than we would normally. Um, so so are you likely is, to recommend they're given to children? That's what I'm just trying to get to. Sorry, I just need to get to that point. Yeah, I, I was I was distracted by the, uh, the the suggestion that there's something unsafe about. It was meant as a compliment, by the way, doing it in a hurry. It wasn't wasn't meant in any other way. <laughs> okay, um, so I, I think as far as um, which segments of the population um, should be vaccinated, and, and I think it comes back to the uh, the comment that Robin made that it depends a bit on the characteristics of the vaccine. So clearly, if you've got a vaccine that prevents um, severe disease and death. The first question is to target and to, to use it for those at highest risk, which are older adults and those with other health conditions. If you have a vaccine that prevents transmission, um, then there could be much broader benefits for the wider population um, to use it. And does and your vaccine accurate. prevent transmission? Do you think it prevents transmission? Well, we don't know. I mean, that's why we're doing trials to address these questions. I, 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 it's not something to speculate on at the moment. It, it's, we have to understand in humans um, exactly um, what uh, the vaccine characteristics are. Can it can prevent acquisition of the virus? Can it prevent uh, symptomatic disease, hospitalisation, and so on? Um, and that, that has to be conducted. So, could it, are you likely? I'm trying to get a sense. As you obviously, you're quite well. You, you said it might be potentially approved by Christmas. Uh, is this likely to be a vaccine that is recommended for use by children? Can I just ask you that question? Um, so I didn't say it would be approved by Christmas. I said that we uh, hope we'll have some results by the end of the year. Um, the, as far as uh, giving the vaccine to children, the first step is the clinical trials have to happen in a, in a childhood population. And those trials are being planned. Um, but that's uh, at the moment we don't have any data about the immune response or the safety in children, and so that that is something which has to be done um, again through the normal scientific process. And I, I would ex anticipate that that will happen um, towards the end of this year or during the early part of next year. Um, so that's that's the first step. As far as deploying vaccines in children, that will be a policy decision that it, that will be based on. Uh, what the understanding is of the characteristics of the vaccine and whether it can prevent, prevent transmission and disease, whether there are groups of children from the epidemiology who are at particular risk of severe disease who might be targeted, and then I think questions um, about whether broader use in, uh, amongst children could have a wider benefit both for children and for society as a whole. But all of that has to be um, looked at from a policy perspective from uh, independent scientific advice. And Professor Shatter? So uh, the answer is very similar. Um, we will be looking at doing trials uh, in de-escalating age, uh, assuming we have the funds to do that. But I don't think that it will be immediately rolled out in, in young children. Um, and there is that risk benefit issue beyond those that may have underlying uh, conditions that may make them more susceptible to COVID-19. Most young children actually won't suffer seriously from COVID-19. So in many ways, that, that equation between tolerability of vaccine, side effects versus the benefits are quite different in that age group, where by and large, if it was a vaccine that prevented transmission, they would be taking that to protect uh, vulnerable populations rather than getting an immediate direct benefit themselves. Thank you. Thank you. I'd come to Dean Russell, but just um, on this point, I mean, there are there are two sort of broad approaches, uh, are there not? One is to, to vaccinate those that are most vulnerable, um, and the other is to vaccinate those who are perhaps you know, most robust, um, but by uh, protecting them, you protect um, the, uh, the, the more vulnerable people. In other words, do you, uh, do you target, first of all, the, the elderly and those with um, uh, 
pre-existing medical conditions uh, or children. Do you, for your particular vaccines, perhaps starting with Professor Shattuck, do you, do you have a view as to which of those approaches uh, should pertain? Well, I think, again, that the, the fact that we don't know whether these vaccines will block transmission or prevent disease is a critical determinant in how they will be used. So if they, if they are very effective at blocking disease but don't impact on transmission, the argument is totally for va uh, vaccinating vulnerable populations because that's where it will have the most immediate benefit. And that also should be, in terms of prioritization, the most effective strategy. Until we get information whether any of these vaccines block transmission, the question as to whether it should be rolled out uh, widely in the UK population is one that remains unanswered. And that will be balanced by the level of efficacy against transmission and the level of vaccination at a population-wide level that would be required to actually prevent ongoing transmission. And we don't have data to make those equations right now. Thanks. Uh, and Professor Pollard, uh, for your uh, vaccine, do you have a view as to how it should be deployed first? Well, well I, I, I think, as I said before, that, that will be a, a policy decision. But I, you know, I think initially, um, when you have relatively constrained supply, which I'm sure there will be for many of the vaccines, the first groups um, to be targeted, in my view, would be those at either risk of disease, such as healthcare workers, or at risk of severe disease, and particularly older adults and those with other health conditions. And I, I completely agree with Robin that children are relatively unaffected uh, by the virus. And so for their own protection, the priority shouldn't be children, um, but uh, for um, others in, uh, in the population. Thank you, that's very clear. Uh, Dean Russell and then Catherine Fletcher. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a, a few questions, uh, which are probably practical questions uh, to, to both the witnesses, please. Um, first of all, um, I'll go through them and, and uh, all together if that's okay. First of all, I'd just be very interested to know whether the vaccine is planned to work on people who've already had COVID. Uh, obviously, we've got a large number of the population who will have had COVID during the past uh, eight or nine months. You know, will it be used for them? Uh, the second question relates to the previous questions around the order of rollout, uh, but also related to um, a comment that's been made around what the uh, vaccines will actually do in terms of could they prevent um, transmission and so on. Do you see there being a, a chance that there would be multiple vaccines? So one perhaps uh, reducing transmission and another uh, preventing somebody from getting the um, symptoms. Um, do you see a position where we might get to a point where we have an annual vaccine or do you see this as a one-off? Um, and then I'd also be very keen to understand on the trials. I know one of the big issues that's been uh, reported is around the impact on the BAME community. I was interested to know how that's going in terms of trials, whether it has more or less of an impact uh, and how that's working. And then uh, very finally, a very practical question. Uh, am I correct in assuming any vaccine that comes out would be an injection um, or would it be uh, delivered through a different approach from the work that's been done so far, please? OK, three questions there, perhaps um, starting with Professor Shattuck. So the first question related to whether these vaccines would be used for those that had already had COVID-19. And I think the answer there is yes, they, they, there is evidence that they would boost potentially those that may have a variety of levels of immune response to COVID-19. Uh, that's already incorporated in, in our current trials and I, I suspect in the Oxford trials as well. Um, the question about transmission versus infection is, is really one that we won't know till we get the data. Um, do I think there may be a requirement for... yes, on, on that point though, do you see a point where if, if one vaccine could work for transmission and a different trial from another country perhaps works on, on another level, could you ever see a case where there could be two vaccines that people have to take? So I think it, it's more likely that we'll see different waves of introduction of vaccines. So it's unlikely that a vaccine that blocks transmission won't also prevent severe disease. But it's certainly possible that the first vaccines may reach the bar of preventing severe disease, but may not necessarily block transmission. And so we may see those introduced first because they'll be first past the post. But as we see later vaccines that may be more potent, we may see that they're replaced. Uh, 
And so it's quite likely that we will have a number of vaccines uh, introduced. Um, they will need to be monitored carefully because we won't know how long they'll provide immunity for. And so we certainly need to have a strategy for uh, reboosting, most likely reboosting of vulnerable populations where immunity may, may potentially wane faster. Um, and so those, those uh, considerations need to be taken into account. Uh, the approach that we're developing is, is particularly suitable for reboosting campaigns because you get no immunity against the vaccine itself, um, which is something that occurs with some of the, the viral vector delivered vaccines. Thank you. Um, you also asked about BAME, BAME uh, effects, and certainly we're looking at that in our trials. We would still like to encourage more people from those groups to come forward for clinical testing um, because it's really a, an important consideration. But so far, we haven't seen any evidence of either increased side effects or less potent immune responses in those, those groups. Thank you. Professor Pollard, you. Uh, same questions. Uh, thanks. Um, so I, I guess the, uh, the the first question was about um, people who have previously had COVID, those who are positive already um, at baseline. And uh, one of the uh, the requirements for regulators around the world is that that group of people is included in the clinical trials. And the reason for that is when we get to the point of rollout, we know that there will be some people in the population who don't know they've had the disease. And so we need to know, first of all, the point that Robin made, whether or not they boost but also whether there are any safety concerns of people who have been previously infected getting the vaccines. So in our trials, we, we have in, um, included seropositive people, people who have previously um, had infection. So we will be able to answer that question. Um, uh, the, the, the second um, question was about um, you know, whether we'll have different types of vaccines which do different things. Um, First of all, we, we don't have the data, so I don't, I don't know that yet. Um, that's something which uh, we'll have to find out in time. The second thing uh, that really in answer that question is when you look at the different trials that are going on around the world, I'm not sure that all of them will actually address the question you're asking. So we, we may um, have quite good clarity about whether the vaccines prevent symptomatic disease, because that's the primary endpoint, the primary analysis that's undertaken in all of the trials. But the transmission question is actually a much harder one to get to. Um, it, you, one way you could do it is look in the households of those people who are vaccinated and see if there are less people in that household who get um, disease. The other would be to uh, actually look at individuals to see whether they get infected if they've been vaccinated, even if they, they have no symptoms. And that's what we're doing in our trials in the UK. And I think, you know, a pretty amazing effort with government and, and with uh, the NHS. Uh, we're, we're taking swaps from 10,000 people in the trials every week um, during the course of follow-up to find out whether um, people um, have asymptomatic infection. If those who are vaccinated don't get asymptomatic infection, that makes it very likely that the vaccine could be transmission blocking. Um, so that's, that's something which we will know in, in time, uh, but it's going to take a while to, uh, to dig into to the results. But I, I think one word of caution is I'm not sure we'll have the transmission question from all of the trials um, that are going on uh, around the world. Um, uh, you, you also asked a question about whether we need annual vaccines. And uh, of course, we don't know the answer to that. The, the main reason you would need an annual vaccine, one is that the immunity you get from uh, the first two doses that you have doesn't last and you become susceptible to reinfection. Um, I think that is possible. Um, the only um, situation we have to fall back on, which, which is the coronaviruses that all of us normally get as children, which is, no, these, this is a family of viruses, which is actually very common. And we all get those viruses as children. Um, unfortunately, we don't get perfect immunity when we get those infections as children. And through our adult life, uh, every few years we'll get a cold caused by coronavirus. Now, we don't get severely ill with it. Uh, we get a mild infection. But it does tell you something about the immunity from natural infection over time not being complete. It doesn't give you complete protection. We don't know whether vaccines are going to be like that or whether they'll um, give complete protection that lasts for years. And the only way we'll know the answer to that is actually by some time passing. You know, the, the first vaccines are only six months in. So we can't tell whether we're still protected a year from now. And of course, we don't even know whether the vaccines are protective yet. 
um, in the first six months. The other reason why we might have a, a need for annual vaccination would be like influenza, where the virus changes each year. Um, perhaps if you have lots of people vaccinated, the virus, in order to survive, will have to mutate um, so that uh, the vaccine is no longer able to protect against. And that's what influenza does to some extent. And uh, so that would be another reason why we might need to have a revised vaccine in, in future years. At, at the moment, we, we just don't know the answer to that question either. We, we've not seen changes in the virus that uh, so far that seem likely um, to have that impact. Um, but there are lots of people who are immune in populations at the moment to try and drive the virus to do that. Um, you, you then asked about the BAME um, population uh, included in the trials uh, that we're undertaking here in the UK. Um, that will be part of the analyses that we do um, later on. Um, I think one of the really important um, strategies that we have in our vaccine development program um, was to ensure that we were, we were inclusive from a UK population, but also that uh, the, there was generalizability around the world. And so our trials are set up so that we have um, uh, 10,000 people uh, vaccinated in Latin America, um, 2,000 in Africa, and uh, we also, through um, our partnerships, have people being vaccinated in Asia as well. So we, we have a large um, a database of, of information that is being gathered from different ethnic and geographic settings around the world, as well as trying to address those issues here um, in the UK. Thank you very much, Nate. Um, and Thank lastly, you asked about whether, whether it's all injection, um, and uh, the answer is that almost all of the vaccines being developed are looking um, only at injections. Um, it is possible that there could be some vaccines later on um, which um, use a different route of immunization, like the, the nasal flu vaccine that's used at the moment. But uh, none, none of those are at, at an advanced stage of development. Um, and so I think we, we can't really answer that, whether that's possible, certainly not in the near future. Thank you very Thank much indeed. Catherine Fletcher. Thank you, Chair. As is so often in my life, Mr. Dean Russell has already landed very much on the question I wanted to ask. So I'm going to talk piece slightly. Because um, ultimately, what's this about? It's about um, people having confidence that they can go and hug their granny without giving her something that might put her life at serious risk. So I would love to hear from those in the field where you think that bar is in terms of the success. And, you know, we would all love to take one injection that gives us 100% confidence that we can't put anyone at harm and we ourselves are not going to come to harm. That's possible in the future. We're not going to get there right now. So where for different populations, different ethnicities, different communities in the UK, what does success look like? Perhaps if I start with Professor Pollard and then on to you, Professor Shattuck. I mean, I, I think um, we, we first of all have to have the results of the trials which tell us the, the level of efficacy of the vaccines. And uh, I, I think one of the, the really difficult questions that, that you're asking is, uh, does, does that uh, result, I mean, let, let's say the, the answer was 70%, let's just pick a figure, um, then uh, that means that 30% of those people vaccinated are not protected. And then if only 70% of the population agree to be vaccinated, or whichever group you're, you're talking about, older adults or, or, or those with health conditions, and then you end up with only about 50% of the people that you really want to protect actually being protected. So it makes a huge difference when you look at um, impacts on the health system and, and the economy and so on. Um, but it doesn't mean that the pandemic ends on the, the first day that you have a vaccine available. Um, because we will still have some ongoing transmission um, and need for treatments for those who still become unwell um, and so on. So I, I think the vaccines could have an enormous impact from where we are today, um, but it's unlikely that immediately um, that sort of ends um, all of the, um, the, the, the measures that we have in place and the need to have the, the development of treatments that um, Peter Horby talked about earlier. So, uh, Catherine? May I push you? May I just push you? So what does success look like? You know, if, when I get stopped at outside Tesco's, what's good? We know we're not going to get to great, but what's good? Well, but I, but I think good is, is having vaccines that have um, significant efficacy. So, I, I mean, whether that's 50, 60, 70, 80 percent, whatever, whatever the figure is, that is an enormous achievement. It means that uh, there are, uh, from a health system point of view, 
there are fewer people with COVID going into hospital, um, but people who develop cancer can have their operations um, or their chemotherapy. It, it, it's a complete game changer um, and a success um, if we meet those efficacy endpoints. But, but uh, unfortunately, it doesn't mean that we can all um, go back to normal immediately um, because it takes time to roll out vaccines. Not everyone will take them. And we will still have um, people getting this virus because it's just too good at transmitting. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Professor Shattuck. I, I don't think I have to have anything more to add. I think Professor Pollard has given an excellent answer to your question. So, so in layman's terms, we are going to eat the elephant of COVID a spoonful at a time. There's no silver bullets here when it comes to vaccines and vaccine production. I think that's right. I think it's it's unrealistic to expect that the UK government will, the UK country will wake up and hear there's a vaccine that's successful and life gets back to normal immediately. And we're likely to be living with the consequences of this virus for many years to come, even though vaccines will make life uh, much, much better and reduce, hopefully, fatalities and serious illness significantly. Well, may I just say, for a virus that we hadn't even really heard about last December, you know, it's testimony to the scientific community, both in the UK and around the world, that we're even having this conversation at a great level of detail. So let me extend my personal thanks. Thank you. And I think the uh, committee shares uh, that sentiment. Uh, a couple of brief questions from Sarah Owen and then Luke Evans. Thanks, Chair. This is to Professor Pollard to start with. Um, the success of any vaccine is reliant on take-up, I think, as we've just discussed there, um, and also the distribution. So every year we have the flu vaccine and the winter flu season upon us, but we struggle to reach the 75 per cent um, of people that need it and, and are vaccinated. Obviously, this is going to be a much bigger programme. How do you see this being distributed um, effectively? Uh, well, I, I'm not um, party to the, to the discussions about that. Um, that's that really for the Department of Health and for the well, NHS. Who would, you, who would you see administering this? Uh, but, but what I am aware is that there's a huge amount of planning going on to think about um, how, how that might actually be resourced and delivered. And we, we certainly have seen news reports um, about this, um, which, which have, uh, have um, you know, demonstrated that within the NHS, there's a lot of planning going on uh, to try and work out how distribution could happen. Um, and of course, it will depend a bit on um, how the vaccine is being targeted, which again will be a policy decision uh, from the Department of Health at, at the time that a vaccine is available. Um, so I, I, I think the answer is I, I don't really know, but um, the uh, other people are the experts in this area. We'll have the Thank you, We'll have the chance to um, put those questions uh, in the next uh, panel. Um, is that okay, Sarah? Have you got any? It was fine. It was just it was just depending on what type of vaccine that we're looking at. Are we looking at one of the vaccines that needs to be frozen, or are we looking at a vaccine that could be much more simply um, distributed? And I think that's a, an important question. I, I mean, I think from a UK infrastructure point of view, it's obviously more difficult if they have to be frozen, um, but not uh, but not impossible. If in other parts of the world, frozen vaccines are much more difficult to uh, to manage. Um, uh, the, the vaccine being developed here um, from Oxford in partnership with AstraZeneca is, is at fridge temperatures, um, so it, it would be just uh, could be deployed through the normal distribution system for vaccines. Um, I think the, um, uh, some of the other vaccines will require freezing, um, but uh, you know, again, I, I don't see that as, a, as going to be um, a showstopper. It's something which needs some logistics, but, it, but it's not a showstopper. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Luke Gavins had a, uh, a question, and then Neil Hanvey. Very quick question to uh, Professor Pollard. Um, in the summer, Russia announced that they had a vaccine and were rolling something out from there. Could you pass comments on the efficacy of that, what's happened? Because it's gone very quiet from a UK perspective. I wondered what the scientific evidence in the world is about that. Uh, well, I, I don't have any um, insight into efficacy data because um, there hasn't been any um, published. Um, the, the, the Russian vaccine in, in many ways is rather similar to the one that we're developing um, and also similar to the one that Johnson & Johnson are developing and, and, and one of the Chinese developers um, in that it's a viral vector um, vaccine. And uh, they, they have published some early data showing good immune responses uh, for their vaccine. And, and it's sort of what you would expect um, when you compare with these other viral vector vaccines. So there's 
Um, there's, there's nothing sort of uh, that's surprising about what we've seen so far, but it's really so, just in the public domain, immune response data. Uh, we, we haven't seen any published efficacy data. And I, and I would think like, like for everyone else, um, the, uh, you need time to accumulate sufficient cases um, in the trials in order to be able to measure the extent to which the vaccine prevents disease. So it may be that they haven't quite reached that point yet to, to give an efficacy estimate. Thank you. Uh, Neil Hanvey. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I, a lot of this discussion has been around the general population. I want to uh, focus, if I may, on uh, a, a very small but vulnerable uh, uh, group in the population, and those are people with uh, uh, a diagnosis within the blood cancers uh, uh, cohort of patients. And um, given that the pathology uh, of many of the diseases within there uh, and the um, effect of the associated therapies um, has a, a significant impact on risk uh, um, and immunity, coagulopathies and various other challenging um, uh, issues to address. And I'd be interested to know what conversations have taken place within uh, the hemato-oncology uh, specialisms uh, to help understand whether um, those types of patients are suitable candidates uh, at any stage and uh, what immunotherapies could be uh, deployed to support them, uh, if there's any thoughts uh, around that. Um, yeah, uh, I'll just I'll finish off and then that's the question my question done. And the other the other two aspects of that that I'd be really interested in is in terms of your view of um, if they're not suitable candidates, would it then follow that the next best thing would be to ensure that the, um, the staff who are treating and caring for uh, such patients and the families of those patients should be uh, urgent candidates for uh, vaccination when it comes uh, when, when we're in that position? Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps starting with um, uh, Professor Shattuck. Um, so uh, we are still at a stage of testing the vaccine in, in healthy volunteers, and we need to uh, get more safety data before we go to such at-risk groups. Um, your question is very much a clinical question, so I'll defer really the answer to uh, Professor Andrew Pollard, who has more experience in that area. Thank you. Professor Pollard. Um, thanks. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I mean, I think the, the there's two sort of components to this. One is uh, if you have a condition which means your immune system it doesn't work and some people on chemotherapy for example with blood cancers will not be able to make immune responses then vaccines don't work in that population and, and that that is that will be um, true for for all vaccines whether they're covid or otherwise <clears throat> if however it's we're talking about people who have recovered or recovering from uh, various types of cancers then and their immune system is now working there's no reason to think that um, if, if uh, they're suitable for other vaccines, that COVID vaccines uh, wouldn't work. So I think it depends a little bit on the context we're talking about. And there are um, expert uh, bodies in this country um, who represent um, either through the charities or through expert medical groups, those um, different um, segments of, of the population with, with health conditions who will give specific advice once we know more about um, the uh, available vaccines. And the second point was about um, family members and uh, healthcare workers. And I think this comes back a bit to the previous question that if the vaccines prevent transmission, vaccinating those in a cocoon around the vulnerable individuals could be extremely important in protecting them from COVID if indeed they can't be protected themselves with vaccines. Um, if, if, however, the vaccines don't prevent transmission, the main purpose of vaccinating family members and, and other um, healthcare workers who are looking after them will be to defend those individuals from the disease so that they can continue to look after their relatives. And so I think there is a role there um, uh, for vaccines, um, as, as was indicated. Um, but uh, you know, re really, I think the, the, for the individuals with those diseases, it's really the previous um, discussion that you had around treatments, um, which is probably much more relevant. Are the, are the 
for example, monoclonal antibodies, which could be given to those individuals uh, immediately after exposure to, to ensure that they don't develop disease, or if they do develop disease, to treat them very early. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Neil. And a final um, uh, follow-up question from James Davis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Professor Pollard, um, I, my understanding is that the risk of COVID-19 mutating regularly is relatively low, certainly compared to influenza, for instance. But what is your assessment as to the likelihood that we will need uh, vaccines that uh, change each year or, or at various uh, intervals in the future? Um, well, it, it, the, uh, the virus, the coronavirus, is an RNA virus, which is the same as influenza. And RNA viruses um, make mistakes um, when they're copying their um, genetic code um, all the time. So the chance of the virus changing is actually quite high. The chance of it changing in the, the particular component of the virus, which binds onto the ACE2 receptor um, to cause infection, I think is relatively lower. Um, because uh, in order to be able to bind onto the receptor, um, the, the, uh, the a shape of the spike protein, which is the protein on the virus that binds, can't change, otherwise it won't be able to invade our cells um, through the ACE2 receptor. So uh, it, it's not impossible, um, but I think so far we've not seen as the virus has changed over the last nine months, um, that it has had major changes in that bit which binds onto the ACE2 receptor to make it uh, no longer uh, 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 um, preventable through the, the vaccines in development. I, I think the uncertainty though comes that this virus at the moment is not under any pressure to make changes in that bit of its uh, genome because we don't have immune human populations. It's still transmitting very happily um, across the world um, as it is at the moment. And it may be that it ha if it has to change that bit of its um, genome, then uh, it may be less fit and transmit less well or, ha or not be able to cause infection so readily. Um, so I think uh, it, it remains a possibility that it could change and that may be a problem for vaccines and require redesign. Um, the moment we haven't seen that, but we haven't really put it under pressure. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, and finally to uh, Professor Pollard. Um, if, the, if we have a vaccine um, that uh, perhaps hasn't had the approval of the American authorities, the FDA and the European authorities, the EMA. Do you think we should be in a position, uh, if our regulatory authority, the MHRA, approve of it, we should be able to proceed? Um, I mean, I think the, uh, all of the regulators around the world are very rigorous. They use the very, the very similar approaches to regulation and review. I, I would not imagine that either developers can submit for approval in, in all regulatory authorities at the same time, or that all regulatory authorities will take the same time for approvals. So I think it is likely that we'll have uh, some regulatory approvals happening before others. Um, and I, I don't see that as a, 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 as a problem. I, I think I would expect that to happen um, just because of the, the, the scale of, of interest in, in vaccines around the world for prevention. Um, I, I do think um, the regulators are talking to each other and looking about alignment um, to, to try to uh, make it as uh, smooth a process as possible. Um, Thank you. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's going to be down to them. They have to do it independently and rigorously. And, and, and obviously, when we provide them with the data, but we don't get involved in the decision making. Thank you very much indeed. That's uh, very clear. Uh, can I say to you, Professor Pollard uh, and to Professor Shattuck, uh, thank you for your evidence today. Uh, but most of all, thank you for the extraordinary work that you and your teams uh, have been doing on behalf of the whole world uh, over what is a relatively short uh, period of months, um, but it is of crucial importance. We're very grateful for that work and for your evidence today. Uh, thank you very much indeed. We'll now move to our thank final uh, panel of witnesses. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Professor Wei Shen Lim, uh, who is a consultant respiratory physician at the Nottingham University Hospitals Trust uh, and is chair of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation uh, in respect of its COVID-19 uh, related work. Uh, thank you, Professor Lim, for joining us. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Kate Bingham, who is chair of the UK Vaccines Task Force. Uh, welcome, uh, Kate Bingham. I um, can't actually see... Kate Bingham. 
Okay, I'm, there I'm she on. is. There she is, uh, hove into view. Perhaps I can start uh, with you, Kate Bingham. You, you were appointed chair of the Vaccines Task Force on the 16th of May. Can you uh, tell the, the committees um, and those watching uh, what's the purpose of the task force um, and what's it achieved um, since you were appointed? Excellent, thank you. So w the Vaccine Task Force was asked to ensure that the UK has access to clinically safe and effective vaccines as soon as possible. And in so doing, place the UK at the forefront of vaccine research and development. So it's important that we ensure equitable access of vaccines worldwide, that's a key goal of ours, and also ensure that the UK is well prepared for future pandemics. So those were the tasks, the three tasks we were given. Um, I was in front of this committee four months ago and I've been in post about six months, and I think we've made huge progress. The UK uh, now has access to six different vaccines across four different formats because we don't know which of any of these different types of vaccines will actually work. So we've actually secured 350 million doses, obviously vastly in excess of what we need because we are expecting vaccines to fail. And as we've just heard from Professor Pollard, we could be weeks away from the first interim data um, review for the Oxford uh, vaccine. And also, we're in that same uh, time frame, we should be looking at the interim data for the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, which are the two vaccines which have the possibility of being ready before um, uh, the end of the year. Which are those um, two? Uh... So it's the Oxford, Oxford AZ is the one vaccine and the Pfizer BioNTech is the other vaccine. Okay. They're both very different vaccines, but they're both uh, in the position where we should be um, able to look at that interim data um, this year, or at least the first set of interim data. And there has also been discussion this morning about neutralizing antibodies. And of course, that's critical to have the prophylactic protection for those people who are immunocompromised or can't receive vaccines. So we've also secured um, rights to um, uh, AstraZeneca's uh, cocktail of antibodies, as it's called. Um, and what we've been doing to ensure that the vaccines are ready as soon as they um, are approved is we are manufacturing now so that we have vaccines already ready in place so that as soon as we have um, uh, approval from the MHRA, we'll be able to um, uh, start deploying them or hand them to help them deploy. And we've done that because we've been able to accelerate the development of the clinical trials, um, not in terms of safety, but in terms of how can we get the trials enrolled. So we've done for the very first time um, a national citizen registry, which has been uh, created on the NHS website. And as of this morning, we have 305,000 people who've registered their interest in getting involved in clinical trials. So to all those people, I'd like to say thank you. But that is a phenomenal resource and in fact is being used as we speak to enroll in clinical trials, including in prophylactic clinical trials with the um, AZ uh, antibody. We've also put in place standardized immune assays so that we can compare assays head to head or the vaccines head to head. And we've also created, again, a world first, a human challenge model for COVID vaccines. So um, subject to final uh, ethics approvals um, and all sorts of things have to work, we should be in a position to be able to start evaluating new vaccines in a much more streamlined, rapid way next year, which again, will accelerate the development of the next wave of vaccines. Um, and then finally, the other aspect of um, the role that the task force has been asked to deliver is around manufacturing. So if I give you a very quick tour around the UK, starting in Scotland, we've expanded this Scottish um, company's manufacturing plant, Balneva, up in Livingston. We funded the um, Centre of Process Innovation in Darlington to help develop GMP manufacturing capability for mRNA vaccines. We've significantly expanded and started building now the Vaccines Manufacturing and Innovation Centre in Harwell. We've bought a veterinary va man manufacturing site in Braintree that again is, is managed by now the cell and gene therapy catapult. We've just issued a uh, request for proposals for bulk antibody manufacture in the UK because we have no bulk antibody manufacturing in the UK. And we've been working very closely with um, the CDMOs, so the contract development organizations around the UK, without whom we could not be in this very fortunate position. So that includes companies, um, Cobra in Kiel, 
Oxford Biomedica in Oxford, uh, 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 Watcart in Wrexham to do the fill finish. So I think we've done a pretty neat job on the really getting the manufacturing capability in the UK uh, fit for purpose. Three of the six vaccines that we have secured for the UK are being manufactured in the UK. And then the last, and by no means least, probably the most important aspect, is the global role we have played um, in shaping COVAX, which is the, the global facility for buying and distributing vaccines. So the UK has given a, a, a pledge of half a billion pounds, and that has not only um, encouraged others to participate, but this really is going to make this a phenomenally important uh, and essential uh, facility to ensure that everybody who is vulnerable to this disease is vaccinated and not just those countries um, who are best able to pay for it. Thank so you. overall, I think in, we've, we've done pretty well. Uh, thank you. And uh, before I turn to my colleagues, starting with Graham uh, Stringer, this is a lessons learnt uh, review, um, as you know, by the, the two committees. Um, so uh, you've, uh, you've noted some of the, the successes and achievements. Uh, if I can put it this way, what have you succeeded in spite of? What are the uh, obstacles that you've had to overcome so that we can learn how not to impose them in the future? Well, um, as you will all know, uh, generally government is not a quick running organization and um, speedy decision making is not necessarily something that governments should normally be doing. But I have to say, in this case, it's worked incredibly well because um, I've been given both the space to build a team uh, and the team has been incredibly effective and I'm really proud to be working with uh, my, my team members. Um, but we've also been given a ring fence budget which is controlled by uh, ministers. So the vaccine task force makes recommendations for ministerial approvals, and then we have very quick decision making. So th I think the speed uh, is a very um, important lasting legacy for how can we do this again in the future. And, and that I think has been important. And then the other side that I think has been a challenge for us is we basically do need stronger scientific expertise and stronger industrial experience in the government. It's, we don't have enough scientists. We don't have enough people, people that have come from STEM backgrounds or have come from industrial backgrounds. And that's why those are the skills I've brought into the immediate team, but more broadly around government, it would be really helpful if we had more scientists in government. And when you say in government, are you talking about the Department of Health, the Department of Business, um, number 10 in the Cabinet Office? I'm actually talking about all of it, because all of those departments are groups with whom we have worked very closely. So our investment committee, for example, are the secretaries of state for Bayes, Health, Cabinet Office and Treasury. And uh, it would be great if all of those departments could be much better populated with scientists and industrial um, experts. All right, thank you. Graham Stringer. Uh, thank you. That was quite a, a, a sort of force, and, and you've uh, answered some of the uh, questions I, I, I was going to ask. But the first one was about whether or not the vaccine was being manufactured now, and you've told us it is. Uh, at, at what capacity is it being manufactured in this country? If, if you could answer that first, and I'll come to a question about why Braintree. Okay, um, so uh, we've typically bought vaccines in uh, units of 60 million doses on the grounds, and, and um, Wei Shen can talk a little bit about the JCBI advice on the size of the, on the target populations. But we've been working on about a 30 million vulnerable population. So if you take Valneva, for example, up in Scotland, we've, we've acquired 60 million doses, but we've funded the expansion of that plant such that they will have a capacity to manufacture 200 million doses next year. So that where we've had the ability to actually control and influence um, how the manufacturing is done and the scale at which it's done, we've done so at scales that are uh, in excess uh, of what the UK needs, again, to reinforce our commitment to global and equitable access um, and distribution of vaccines. Can, can you be specific? Uh, today on November the 4th, how, how many doses of the Oxford vaccine have been manufactured? Um, I, we, I do know the answer, and it's not being disclosed um, what, what the dose numbers are. 
there's two stages of manufacturing, which is why I'm being a little hesitant here. So you have to make the bulk drug substance itself. So in Oxford's case, you have to make the, um, the adeno-vectored vaccine. And once you've made the drug substance, you then have to put them into vials. Now, we've not yet put them into vials because as soon as you put them into vials, you start the clock for the, um, basically the, the shelf life or the, how quickly you have to use the vaccine. Um, we are all ready to, to do that, but we haven't done that yet. And so the goal will be to basically, we, once we um, uh, are reasonably sure, and that will be soon, that we're going to um, start um, being able to be in a position to, to look at the, the interim data with the expectation that we may be able to start rolling out. We will then file those, um, the, the doses um, and then hand them over to health for deployment. But it will, be a, it will be a ramp up because as we talked a little bit about, scale up in manufacturing is a, normally takes years to do. And we're doing things um, at a, a speed, and people have used the word before, unprecedented, but this really is an unprecedented speed. And trying to scale up at speed is very challenging. So that we'll be starting with low numbers of doses, by which I do mean millions of doses, but not tens of millions of doses initially, and then that will then ramp up so that um, we will end up with the 100 million doses that we've um, secured from AZ um, in the first half of next year. Right, I'm slightly less reassured about the second part of your answer than the first, but uh, how many of the vaccines that have, are on order uh, have to be stored at very low temperatures? I mean, some of these vaccines have to be stored at the, the, the temperature of solid carbon dioxide, which is very cold in, indeed. H how many of those uh, have been ordered? Uh, we've only ordered those from the Pfizer-BioNTech so far. So what you're referring to are the mRNA vaccines, which is in a similar class to the vaccine that Robin Shattuck is developing, and his is a self-amplifying RNA vaccine. So these are basically very small pieces of genetic material which are very unstable. Hence, the need to keep them um, at such low temperatures. And of course, they may be relatively straightforward to manufacture initially, but the cost of deployment and the complexity of deployment is, is very high. So um, again, I've written about it extensively. We have to find better vaccine formats so that we're not dependent on um, such low temperatures and such complex cold chains, and so that we can actually build something better. And that's the work we're doing with the CPI um, up in Darlington to really try and find different solutions to stabilizing these, what are potentially incredibly potent, valuable vaccines. Were you involved in the decision to invest in vaccine manufacturer at Braintree? Uh, and if you were, uh, why Braintree? One of the impacts of this virus, it appears to be impacting more in the, in the north of England and the government are, have a policy of trying to level up the country. Why invest in a manufacturing capacity in, in Essex? Because it was a veterinary vaccine manufacturing um, plant already. So it was the quickest way we could actually uh, ramp up uh, GMP production of vaccines in a flexible way. So we looked at everything. We looked at de novo sites, uh, brownfield sites, um, other, all, all the different alternatives. And again, the, the requirement and the request from the Prime Minister was to do so as soon as possible. Um, and this is actually a good site. I agree um, we are um, very keen to ensure that we have manufacturing capability around the UK, but um, this vaccine um, plant happened to be in Braintree, therefore that was the one we then prioritised. But uh, I would mention that we, that we have a request for propo uh, proposals on the bulk antibody manufacturing, and I think there is an opportunity to create a a absolutely state-of-the-art antibody plant in the UK. And again, that, that, that process has only just started and there will be huge um, interest to see what are the different options for, for us to actually build that plant. And there again, that I think would provide an opportunity for, for the levelling up, um, as you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just before we come to Jeremy Holmes, then Taiwo, um, who will tell me, um, uh, just to follow up on something that Graham um, asked about, about how many doses have been manufactured. Um, the day after your appointment, uh, the government announced that it had signed a, an agreement between Oxford University and AstraZeneca 
to make up to 30 million doses available by September uh, for the UK. Um, has that been accomplished? No. So that 30 million doses was assuming a linear um, yield on scale up. So what happens is when you start, when you, when you manufacture these vaccines, you start basically at test tube levels and then you scale up sequentially um, and ultimately get to one or 2,000 litre scales. And so the projections that were made in good faith at the time um, to get to 30 million doses in September was assuming that absolutely everything would work and that there were no um, hiccups at all uh, in terms of how you scale up from basically uh, microliter scales through to 1,000 or 2,000 liter scale. Um, and it hasn't gone linearly. Um, and it's not through lack of care and attention or availability of equipment or anything like that. It's just this normally takes a very long time. Sure. So um, it, the answer is no, but, it's, but it, it is now at the, the um, thousand litre scale and that is working. So I'm, I'm quite sure that we've got the, the, um, the process which is now there, but it isn't, this is, this, you know, we're growing live cells. It's, it's not a straightforward um, um, activity. And I have to say the, the skills in the UK in, in advanced manufacturing are world class. So it's, it is challenging. But just to be clear, to, um, to update that figure, so it was um, thought appropriate in May to make an assessment of what we would have available on the stocks, as it were, in September for the purpose of reassuring people that as soon as a vaccine uh, was licensed, was approved, it could be deployed at scale. Um, so uh, as of now, and if you want to kind of forecast perhaps six weeks uh, ahead, how many doses uh, of the Oxford AZ vaccine will be available in the UK? Well, as of now, we've, we've got um, low numbers of, of million doses uh, in bulk drug substance, not vials. And the third batch of the 1,000 litre um, manufacturing is underway now. So that will give us another, that should get us up to, probably up to about 4 million doses that we should have by the end of the year. 4 million by the end of the, the year. Yeah. And then, it, again, it, it then increases because... Again, it's, it's all about having got to that scale, you can then run it quickly. But, but the it's point the of challenges the, of getting to the 1,000 litre scale. But the point of the communication of the 30 million um, was to convey the idea that we were getting ahead of the curve, that we were anticipating the, the need for a mass vaccination programme as soon as uh, a vaccine were, uh, was approved. This was done in advance of many of the, the trials that we've been hearing about. But if we are in the, in the prospect of having low numbers of millions, then that's not going to be available uh, for mass deployment the moment that uh, we, as we hope, get approval, is it? Well, there are various things. We, we have to look at the data, it has to go through the regulators, and then it has to be, start to be deployed. The earliest possible time to look at the data is going to be late November to December then it's still got to go through the regulatory period. So actually, we're going to have more vaccine than we'll be able to deploy, is my expectation, um, because it will take some time, even millions. Trying to vaccinate millions of adults uh, in this um, pandemic is, again, a heroic achievement. It's not been done at this scale before. I'm sure. So I don't think vaccine supply is going to be, is going to be the right limiting step. No, no one doubts that. But when do you expect to see, or hope to see, uh, the first deployment uh, of vaccines to the public? Well, deployment, again, is a health-led activity. If I put on my rose-tinted specs, I would hope that we will see positive interim data from both of Oxford and from Pfizer-BioNTech um, uh, in early December. And if we get that, then I think we've got a possibility of, uh, of deploying by year-end. Um, if not, we'll have to just continue running the studies, as Andy described um, earlier, until we get that efficacy data, which is acceptable to the regulators, and then you can start deploying um, early next year. Okay, but let's take the, uh, the rose-tinted um, view that we might have it available for deployment by the year end. So by the year end, how many doses of vaccines will we have uh, in stock? 
So we will have, um, as I said, low single doses, single digit doses for Oxford and um, up to, um, um, I think up to 10 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech. By that, that date of the end of the year. Okay, thank you. Jeremy Hunt. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Ms Bingham. Um, We've obviously been hearing from some very eminent scientists at Oxford and Imperial this morning. They naturally use quite cautious language. Um, but I think what the public wants, and I wonder whether you could help us with, is just a stronger sense of the likelihood of a vaccine riding to the rescue and getting us out of a hole uh, during the course of the next year. So could I just ask you, in very layman's terms, to tell us, as you look ahead, what do you think the percentage chances are that we will get a vaccine at some stage in the next year that will wipe out coronavirus? Well, to wipe out coronavirus, I think very slim. To get a vaccine that has an effect of both reducing illness and reducing mortality, uh, very high. Because again, we've got, if you look at the data that's been generated so far um, by multiple different uh, vaccines and, and uh, companies so far. Actually, the data is pretty good. What we can see is pretty compelling immunogenicity data um, from these two dose vaccination um, regimes coming from whole inactivated viral vaccines, adeno vaccines, mRNA vaccines, and the protein adjuvant uh, vaccines, all of which the UK has access to. And what we don't know is to what extent does that immune response that we have seen correlate with protection against disease. But um, do I expect that those vaccines, even if they don't 100% protect against infection, are they likely to actually reduce the severity of illness and reduce the levels of death? My view, and I'm not a clinician, is yes, we will see a vaccine that will reduce illness and will reduce death. Okay, second question, if I may, just again, in lay very much in layman's language, but what do you think the chances are that by next Easter, here in the UK, uh, we, will have, we will have a vaccine and been able to give it to everyone who is most vulnerable from catching COVID. So again, the deployment and the, um, the actual vaccination process itself is handled by health, not by me. Uh, we have got two more vaccines coming through um, in the first half of next year. So it's the Janssen um, Ad26 vaccine and the Novavax adjuvanted protein vaccine and we will have the AstraZeneca neutralizing antibody vaccines all in the first half of next year. Um, some of those actually um, closer to Easter. So that together with the Pfizer-BioNTech and AstraZeneca Oxford vaccines gives me- More than 50% you know, confidence? Uh, I would be, but I am a naturally optimistic person. But more than 50% been... confidence that we will by the early summer have a vaccine that we can give to all vulnerable people. I appreciate this as you being yes. optimistic, but I just want to give a sense as to, to what you actually believe, um, with the caveat that you're a natural optimist, but you think we could be in a situation by the Easter early summer where all the vulnerable people in the country have got a vaccine that will have some impact on reducing uh, the dangers of coronavirus. That is my view, yes. Thank you. 50%. Hello, Otemi. Thank you, Chair. My question, my questions are around the distribution and administration of the vaccination. So um, we know that UK pharmaceutical supply chain could be better robust. So, um, what challenges do we currently expect um, in terms of the supply chain? How resilient is that supply chain needed for um, the distribution of COVID nineteen vaccine? Um, my other question is also about um, the administering of the, um, the vaccination. So we've heard there will be changes to the way the vaccines are administered. So could you let us know what regulatory changes um, as they've been put in place and how balanced are these um, changes with regards to safety? Um, but also we know that there is an NHS staffing shortage. Um, in your opinion, do you think the NHS has the capacity to readily deliver this mass vaccination program if it was ready? And what is the estimated number of staff do you think is needed in order for them to actually reach this um, capacity? And how do you plan to increase that capacity? So all those questions. <laughs> so, so, um, there's, there's a lot of questions there. And I'm afraid I'm not the right person to be asking about the detailed deployment because my job finishes 
at the point at which we have the vaccines that are ready and regulated and available to use. They, then I hand over to the Department of Health, and they are responsible for all the, um, the actual deployment um, activities. Our team supports the Department of Health because, of course, this is a massive challenge. Um, Two-dose regimes, as well as flu, because they can't be co-administered. So we are asking vulnerable people to go through three different vaccination um, uh, visits, which is, again, never been done at this scale before. And also, we're not able to tell them precisely when a vaccine might come, what is the nature of the vaccine in terms of the data, because we don't know what these vaccines may, um, or the effects of these vaccines in different groups. So whether or not um, they do actually work in the elderly cohorts, or do they work better in younger people with underlying disease, or do they work better in black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities? We don't know that. And so the, the, the information we give to health is a lot of very ambiguous, these are the different scenarios of what you need to expect. And I have to say, um, what I've seen, which is obviously I'm sitting at the sidelines, is there is a massive um, effort. It looks like it's been beautifully run, and it is, but it don't cut, be under any illusions. This is very complicated, and especially when you add the cold chain requirements, these vials are coming in multi-dose vials, um, especially the RNA vaccine, the BioNTech vaccine, um, has a short um, shelf life. So um, the complexity of administration is, is phenomenal. And I think what you will need to do is to ask the Department of Health to come in and ask. Well, answer. we have Professor Lim. Perhaps um, Pro Professor Lim might um, comment on that um, to Taiwo's question. Oh, thanks. Hi, good morning. Uh, so I am also, unfortunately, not the right person to explain to you the details of the deployment. I have seen, as Kate Bingham has said, uh, I have also seen some of what's been planned, and it looks highly comprehensive, very professional. Uh, but if you want the details, then you really need to ask uh, Department of Health and NHS uh, England regarding the exact deployment schemes. Okay. All right, Taiwo. Yes, but no one's involved with regards to the supply chain um, management of the, the vaccine then? Well, what we have been responsible uh, for... No, no, no. I just... Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Kate. Yeah, no, I, so I, I think you're misunderstanding. I, I think we're, st we're saying here that neither myself, and I speak on behalf of Kate for a moment, perhaps, that neither of us are involved in managing this, but that does not mean there is nobody involved in managing it. There is a huge team that we are aware of that are managing this and doing, as far as I can see, a fantastic job in what is a very, very difficult uh, project. Uh, but we're not the right people to ask regarding the detail that you're asking about. But I can say that we have got um, 150 million vials, stoppers and overseals, um, and we have the supply chains in place um, for future vials, so that we've gone back from saying how many future vials in the case of revaccinations, how many future vials do we need, and then do we have enough tubular glass, which is what is, um, is used to make the vials, and even back to the, to the question, do we have enough of the borosilicate sand to be able to make the, the tubular glass? So that the, the supply chain, as far as getting to the point of having vaccine to deploy, is under control. Thank you. Thank you, Taiwo. Sarah Owen. Thank you, Chair. Um, Kate, I was going to ask a question about the rollout of vaccines, but um, as you've already said that that's not your department, I was going to ask then about the supply chains um, and possibly the rollout for vaccines for COVID-19. Um, would the end of the transition period with the EU affect this in any way, whether it's the supply chain or the rollout? And even if there is a deal between the UK and the EU, how might this affect vaccine rollout or supply chain in Great Britain and Northern Ireland? So, um, caveated by all yeah. the facts that it's not me, um, it, we've put all the Brexit plans in place. So, in fact, for deployment, um, there is a separate um, schedule for deploying vaccines to Northern Ireland. So, in terms of the actual uh, uh, logistics of shipping vaccine, um, if, for example, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, which is coming from um, Belgium, Shipping that, there, there's a separate supply chain that goes directly to Northern Ireland, and then a separate supply chain that comes in um, to, to England, which then gets distributed out to uh, Wales and Scotland. 
So it's been planned. It, it's certainly an additional complexity, as if this wasn't complex enough. Um, but again, I think it's under control. OK, thank you. We've even actually, I might just add, just to be sure that we have vaccine onshore um, in time, we're even um, using air freight in some cases so that we can be sure. Again, it's more expensive, but then we have that additional certainty that we know the vaccine is uh, not um, caught up in any uh, um, blockages anywhere. Thank you, Kate. Sarah, yeah. is that okay? Okay, uh, Dean Russell, and then Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Chair. Um, my questions were also going to be around rollout, but I do have one big question uh, connected to that, which hopefully you can help. One of the conversations I've heard recently are around concerns around taking the vaccine. Uh, I don't mean extremes of anti-vaxxers, which obviously is a very dangerous movement, but actually around the general public where they've said, look, you know, this has gone through very quickly. You know, I've got to inject something into myself that we're unsure of. Uh, could you just give me some reassurance on two parts? One is that it will be safe. And secondly, have there been discussions at this point around a really sophisticated and strong communication strategy to reassure the public that, you know, should they start to be able to take a vaccine, that it will be okay for them? Great questions. Um, so the, the reassurance of will it be safe, um, are, and then Andy talked a little bit about this earlier, the, the safety testing um, and the safety standards that are being uh, imposed on these vaccine trials are no different from any new therapeutic or new vaccines um, that are being developed. So there's been no uh, diminution of standards or shortcuts or anything. So from a perspective of uh, are we using the gold-plated world-class standards for safety monitoring? Yes, we are. We also are benefit in the UK for um, because everybody has an NHS number so we can actually do real-time uh, uh, pharmacovigilance which is how is the how are those people who've received the vaccine uh, performing so that we can monitor to see the, the long-term safety of these studies um, as, a, as an aside I've joined a vaccine study so that if I thought there was um, concerns about safety I wouldn't have done so and I have done so and I can be quite clear that the treatment that I've been getting and the the care with safety is absolutely paramount. So that goes back to, that's your first question. The second bit of about the comms is there's two aspects. From a vaccine task force perspective, yes, we have a, a broad strategy for public education just to tell people about how the vaccines work, what progress we've made, what are the strategies we're using to tackle some of the issues, because our goal is to establish the UK as a global leader in vaccine R&D and, and to encourage international communication. And ultimately, this will be great uh, industry for the UK economy. So our strategy to communicate and collaborate means that I've talked to all sorts of um, groups, whether it's women's groups, civil society groups like Global Justice Now, industry, clinical, manufacturing groups, as well as international groups like the World Bank and Gates. I've given more than 100 interviews. I've written in Nature. I've written in Lancet. Um, we've now got nine podcasts of which um, on Spotify and Amazon, where we specifically tackle some of these issues about safety. Um, how do we get different communities into clinical trials? How are we manufacturing it? What is the role that the UK is playing? In the international community, so um, we're doing um, a sort of a narrow communications um, uh, activity from the vaccine task force. But of course, the broader vaccine communications again will be led by Department of Health as part of their broader vaccination and deployment um, uh, campaigns and communications. And that will address the vaccine hesitance because a lot of vaccine hesitance is not to dismiss people's concerns because they're right to be concerned and it's a complicated fast-moving field um, and we need to address the concerns and allow people to have their conversations with their doctors or their civic leaders or whoever, whoever is trusted that can actually give them advice um, and and the discussions that would be helpful so I think we need to be open to it Thank you. And, and if I may, just a, a couple of related questions. One is um, on the combination. I, I'm pretty confident I asked a question a few months ago in, in one of our health and social care select committees where I'd heard there was uh, tests of a combined vaccine with flu. And I, I heard a comment earlier which seemed to indicate that that's not the case. So I'd just be keen to know whether there is any movement on a combined vaccine. 
And secondly, uh, related to the combination side of things, how have the tests been done with regards, um, you know, people who are taking other types of drugs? Because you know, we, we don't all live in a in a, a COVID-only uh, world. There's lots of other things that people will be taking. I'd just be keen to get reassurance on that. And then, very finally, uh, you mentioned about tracking symptoms once the vaccine's out there. I'm conscious that the uh, NHS. Uh, track and Trace app has, has performed very well. I had, I think, the fastest download of any app ever, um, I believe, um, on the App Store. Um, has there been any discussions around using an app to enable people who've had a vaccine to track their um, their side effects, if there are any, or, or their symptoms as they uh, immediately after they take it? Because I know with the flu vaccine, many people report that they don't feel too great for a few days after. Uh, so if you could cover those points, I'd really Thank appreciate you. it. Okay. Keeping yes. A lot of questions there. Um, so the first one is um, th there are clinical studies, um, small small arms of studies are being run uh, with co-administered with flu, but the bulk of the, of, the, of the main phase three studies are not currently being run with flu. So the initial label uh, is not expected to, to allow for co-administration with flu, albeit those are under investigation now. Ultimately, from a vaccine task force perspective, I would like to see a single shot ideally a pill or something that doesn't involve a needle, which could combine a flu and a COVID antigen and then stimulate immunity twice. But at the moment, in the likely um, initial label that, that, that the regulators are likely to give will not allow for um, co-administration with flu. By this time next year, I'm sure the answer will be it will be, but it's not yet. That's your first question. Co-administration with other drugs? Um, yes, because the point of the trials is to include as diverse a group of people in the clinical trials so that we can be sure that the vaccines can work in all people who are most vulnerable. So in fact, we do and have, have pushed very hard to enrich for black, Asian and minority ethnic communities in our vaccine trials because they are at specific risk from COVID infection. We are also enriching for elderly and those people with underlying serious diseases. All of those, especially the people with underlying serious diseases, will be taking medicines. And we want to be sure that these vaccines are safe in those groups and that the vaccines are effective. So yes, we will be, um, that is in, in hand. And again, we need to wait to see the data to see whether or not the vaccines actually work. But absolutely, that is being investigated. Um, as far as tracking, that again, really is a uh, Department of Health issue because the MHRA is an agency um, within the Department of Health. And the different tools that they use um, is, is up to them as how to do it. And whether or not the track and trace then feeds into um, the electronic um, medical records, um, I don't know. But that ultimately is obviously what we want. We need to be able to get to a position using the latest AI um, tools that you can actually identify how the vaccines are performing in the wild, as we call it, um, to be sure that they are doing what we expect them to be doing and that they are safe. Thank you. Thank um, you. Perhaps uh, I could... Chairman, could I just add something about the surveillance? Do, yes. Professor Lin. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so the UK is a world leader in actually surveillance of vaccine efficacy and safety. We've done that for uh, the flu vaccines in children and shown that it creates indirect protection in adults. That's a first in the world. Uh, we've shown that there are uh, replacement serotypes when you give the pneumococcal vaccine, and that's the first in the world. And we have very, very good systems for surveillance. Uh, so surveillance covers three areas, really. One is safety, which is ongoing, and there's a passive and an active surveillance system. Uh, and then there's a second looking at vaccine effectiveness. So the clinical trials will give us some information as described by um, Andy Pollard and, and, and so others earlier, but they won't give us all the information that we need. And we need more information on subgroups of patients and particular outcomes such as hospitalization or, or mortality. And these things will come from uh, good surveillance systems which are already in place for flu, for example, and will be adapted for COVID as well. Uh, and the third area is vaccine coverage. We need to know where the vaccine goes to, who's having the vaccine, and how we can adjust vaccine coverage accordingly. And that's already in place. Uh, so uh, quite apart from whether there's going to be an app or not, there 